Well, I think there are two things that need to be considered. One is, I think the poll reflected the popular decision here, reduce government spending. The other thing that those in Sacramento have tried to do is look at ways to increase revenue. Well, one of the ways you can do that is by taxes. That was the, the favorite option of 11 percent here. We have reached, I think, long since the limit on taxation. And the reason is very simply this. If you are looking to try to restore California's competitiveness as a business climate so that we can once again attract investors and job creators, you've got to ask yourself the question that they are asking themselves when they hear one of us say, come to California. If you need to have a second plant, put it in California. I had that experience <laughs> in the early 90s. I took with me the legislative leadership and I said to them, we're going on a marketing trip. We're going to seek people who will invest in California and create jobs for us because that's how to create revenues in a healthy way. Well, when we got to Chicago, we had a breakfast and I had said, okay, I'll open the pitch. Willie, then you take it and then Ken, you say something. Then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. The first question I got was not a question, it was commentary. And the comment was this, Governor, Mr. Speaker, Senator, thank you for the breakfast, thank you for coming. He said, I've actually been fortunate enough to gain some market share. I could use a second plan. And you've come here this morning to tell me that I should put it in California. I feel that I owe you some candor. He said, California is the last damn place in the world I would ever put a second plant because of the nightmare experience I've had with the first one. Now, this was in the early 90s. And what he was complaining about were taxes, excessive regulation, great delay in permitting, multiple permitting with one hand not helping the other, different levels of government actually working for cross purposes. The point simply is this. In trying to figure out how you get well in this situation, you've got to remember a couple of things. The first is that you cannot borrow your way out of this unless you have the reasonable expectation that the borrowing will be short term and permit you to generate the revenues necessary in future to get well, to repay the debt that you have created by borrowing and to once again have what the Constitution commands. And it's very clear. It says that the governor shall submit to the legislature a budget in which expenditures and revenues are in balance. Anybody in any doubt about what that means? I said to my successor when he said, I'd really like your counsel, I said, I'm leaving you with a very substantial surplus. I think it was something upwards of $12 billion. And it was after a huge tax cut in the car tax. I said, but I want to tell you something. Don't take great comfort in that surplus because I will tell you that the only thing standing between financial ruin, potentially for the state, and the utterly irresponsible appetites of the legislature for spending is you, you and you alone as governor, have the power to say, I'm not signing that and don't bring me something else that is not in balance. And is that easy to do? It is not easy to do because sitting up here are two former legislators, not just former legislators, but a former speaker and a former pro tem of the state senate. In addition to their legislative salary, they used to get a small stipend for being the leader. I used to refer to it as combat pay. 
and it wasn't nearly enough to compensate them for what they had to resist in terms of making coherent their caucuses, each of whom consisted of people who thought of themselves as owing their primary allegiance first to arguably their district, that's what representative government is about, but also to whatever particular constituency they felt indebted to either by reason of genuine altruistic support or because they were beholden for some support in getting elected. That too is part of representative government. I understand it. The job of the governor is to be the funnel through all of that, through all of these competing claims, pass and are weighed, prioritized, and you've got to say, no, we're not going to do that, or we're not going to do that much. Mike, in his very articulate analysis of the future and looking back to how they solved it, he, sa he showed that 51%, I think, came from cuts, and that most of the cuts were from Proposition 98. Well, that is justice in a way, I must tell you. But the thing that's troubling, he made very clear, he gave full disclosure, that there is on, there's beyond dispute that whatever cuts come from Proposition 98 must be repaid by law in the future. So you've got inherent in there, embedded in that requirement, essentially a deficit in the making, which was one of the worst decisions, I think, ever made, first by the voters, and then you could argue that the courts upheld it. The point is, you do have to go back to some fundamentals. And the job of the governor is to restrain the appetite of each individual and the collective appetite of the legislature and what is being offered now from various places. There's a desire for a constitutional convention, which is a well-intended, very bad idea. That is Pandora's box. So I think that you really have to go back to some basics, and I don't want to monopolize this. I've already spoken at greater length. But I will tell you that there is simply no substitute for saying we are a state, we can't declare bankruptcy, local governments can, we cannot, and if we are going to ever again be a competitive climate for job creation, then we are going to have to undo some of the things that we have done that have put us in a position where we're simply not competitive. 